Space is big. So big that if you try to comprehend its vastness, your mind might just implode. The universe is a limitless expanse, and the very idea of infinity is something that we as humans struggle to understand. For millennia, we have looked up at the stars and wondered about the nature of the cosmos. And while we have made incredible progress in our understanding of the universe, we are still scratching the surface of its true complexity. Despite our advances in understanding the universe, there are still many existential questions that elude us. One of the most fundamental questions is whether the universe is finite or infinite in extent. While we know that the observable universe is vast, it is only a tiny fraction of the entire cosmos. This means that there is a great deal of space that we cannot observe or explore. The idea of an infinite universe is difficult for our minds to comprehend, yet it is a possibility that cannot be ruled out. In addition, we don't know if our universe is the only one that exists or if it is just one of many universes making up a multiverse. These questions continue to challenge us, pushing us to explore the mysteries of the cosmos and unravel its complex nature. Have you heard of the term Cora? This is the term that was used to describe an indeterminate and formless receptacle that exists between the world of ideas and the physical world. The concept of Cora was introduced by the philosopher Plato in his work Timaeus, and later developed by his student, Aristotle. According to Plato, Cora is a space that is receptive to the forms and patterns of the universe, and is the necessary condition for the existence of physical objects. He compared it to a mother who receives the seed of the father and nourishes it, but does not participate in the formation of the child. In this way, Cora is seen as a passive and receptive entity that enables the creation of physical objects, but does not actively shape them. Aristotle later developed the concept of Cora in his work, where he argued that it was a kind of matter that was necessary for the existence of things in the physical world. He described it as a kind of place that is neither matter nor form, but rather a something that is necessary for objects to exist in space. Imagine that every object in the universe, you, your house, earth, and every other thing, moved one meter to your left. Do you think you'll notice anything different? If such a shift causes no observable change, then we might wonder whether there is any meaningful difference between the universe before and after the shift. This shift experiment was first proposed by Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz in his correspondence with Samuel Clarke. The goal is to argue against the view that space exists independently of the stuff that's in it. Instead, Leibniz says space is merely a convenient way of thinking about the relationships between material objects. But perhaps the most influential view of space and time was put forth by Sir Isaac Newton in the 17th century. Newton believed that space and time were absolute and unchanging, existing independently of any objects or events within it. Space was an infinite void that provided a fixed and stable backdrop against which physical events occur. Like many of his contemporaries, Immanuel Kant was greatly impressed with the scientific advances made by Newton and others. Immanuel Kant rejected the view that space and time are simply objective features of the world, existing independently of human perception and experience. Instead, he argued that space and time are structures that are imposed on the world by the human mind, as part of a framework for organizing experience. According to Kant, knowledge about space and time is synthetic, which means that statements about space and time are not simply true by virtue of the meaning of the words in the statement. Rather, these statements involve the combination of different concepts that go beyond what can be known from the concepts themselves. In other words, knowledge about space and time requires the integration of different experiences and concepts. Kant also rejected the idea that space and time are substances or relations, which were popular views at the time. Instead, he argued that space and time are pure forms of intuition, which are necessary for the organization and synthesis of sensory information. For Kant, space and time were not just subjective constructs or illusions, but rather necessary conditions for the possibility of experience. By imposing a structure on the world, the human mind is able to organize and make sense of the multitude of sensory inputs that it receives. Instead of talking about space and time separately, Einstein united them into a single, four-dimensional space-time. One feature of Einstein's general theory of relativity is that facts about the structure of space-time depend on the distribution of matter in space-time and vice versa, which is captured by the Einstein field equations. 
This was a quote Einstein said. I sometimes ask myself how it came about that I was the one to develop the theory of relativity. The reason, I think, is that a normal adult never stops to think about problems of space and time. These are things that he has thought about as a child. But my intellectual development was retarded, as a result of which I began to wonder about space and time only when I had already grown up. When we look in any direction, the furthest visible regions of the universe are estimated to be around 46 billion light years away. That's a diameter of 540 sextillions miles, that's 5 4 followed by 22 zeros. But this is really just our best guess, nobody knows exactly how big the universe really is. That is because we can only see as far as light has traveled. Or more accurately, the microwave radiation thrown out from the Big Bang since the universe began. Since the universe burst into existence an estimated 13.8 billion years ago, it has been expanding outwards ever since. But because we don't know a precise age for the universe either, it makes it tricky to pin down how far it extends beyond the limits of what we can see. One property that astronomers have tried to use to help them do this, however, is a number known as the Hubble constant. It's a measure of how fast the universe is expanding at the current time. The Hubble constant sets the scale of the universe, both its size and its age. It helps to think about the universe like a balloon being blown up. As the stars and galaxies, like dots on a balloon surface, move apart from each other more quickly, the greater the distance is between them. From our perspective, what this means is the further away a galaxy is from us, the faster it is receding. Unfortunately, the more astronomers measure this number, the more it seems to defy predictions built on our understanding of the universe. One method of measuring it directly gives us a certain value while another measurement, which relies on our understanding of other parameters about the universe, says something different. Either the measurements are wrong, or there is something flawed about the way we think our universe works. Despite our lack of knowledge about the physical extent of the universe, we can be certain that it has an edge in time. The hot Big Bang, which is considered the beginning of our universe, occurred around 13.8 billion years ago. As a result, there is a fundamental limit to how far back in time we can see. Even if we travel at the speed of light, the cosmic speed limit, we can only see up to a certain point. The farther we look, the farther back in time we see, and eventually, we reach a point where we can no longer see anything. This point is known as the cosmic microwave background, which is the oldest light in the universe, left over from the moment when the universe was only 380,000 years old. Beyond the CMB lies the so-called edge of the universe, beyond which we cannot see, and therefore cannot observe or study. Today, most of the galaxies we see are clumped together in galactic groups, like the local group, and rich clusters like the Virgo cluster, separated by enormous regions of mostly empty space known as cosmic voids. The galaxies within these groups are a mix of spirals and ellipticals. Moreover, the composition of the universe is predominantly hydrogen and helium, with heavier elements making up only a small fraction of the normal matter. Nonetheless, these heavier elements play a crucial role in enabling the formation of rocky planets like Earth, as well as complex, organic chemistry. Despite the incredible diversity of celestial objects and phenomena in the universe, the galaxies we observe are remarkably similar. They are generally large, evolved structures that have formed over billions of years through the gravitational clumping of matter. Whether actively forming stars or harboring supermassive black holes at their centers, the galaxies we see provide a window into the dynamic and ever-changing universe in which we live. But as we look farther and farther away, we start to see how the universe grew up to become this way. As we look to greater distances, we find that the universe is slightly less clumpy and slightly more uniform, particularly on larger scales. We see that galaxies are lower in mass and less evolved, there are more spirals and fewer elliptical galaxies. On average, there are greater proportions of Bloor stars, and the star formation rate was higher in the past. There's less space between galaxies, on average, but the overall masses of groups and clusters is smaller at earlier times. It paints a picture of a universe where today's modern galaxies were created by smaller, lower-mass galaxies merging together over cosmic timescales, building themselves up to become the modern-day behemoths we see all around us. But the farther and farther away we go, this gradually changing picture begins to transform abruptly.
When we look back to a distance that corresponds to only 3 billion years after the hot Big Bang, or a distance of about 19 billion light years away, we see that the universe's star formation had reached its peak, with new stars forming at a rate of 20 to 30 times higher than today. At this time, an enormous fraction of supermassive black holes were actively feeding on surrounding matter, emitting vast amounts of radiation and particles into the cosmos. The universe has been slowing down for the past 11 billion years or so. While gravity continues to play a crucial role in the formation of structures, it is gradually losing its dominance to dark energy, which has been driving the universe's expansion for more than 6 billion years. Star formation still occurs, but the maximum rate of star formation was reached in the distant past. The universe is still teeming with supermassive black holes, but they were at their brightest and most active in earlier epochs, with a much greater proportion of them now being fainter and inactive. At around 27 billion light years away, we find ourselves looking back in time to an age when the universe was only 1 billion years old. At this point, the universe was vastly different from what we observe today. Star formation rates were much lower, with new stars forming at only a quarter of the rate they would later reach at their peak. The vast majority of the normal matter in the universe was made up of just hydrogen and helium, with heavier elements making up only a fraction of a percent. This scarcity of heavy elements would have made the formation of rocky planets, like our own Earth, nearly impossible in these early environments. In addition to the lack of rocky planets, every galaxy in the universe at this time would be young and full of young stars, with no elliptical galaxies having formed yet. Furthermore, the cosmic microwave background radiation that permeates the entire universe would have been significantly hotter, appearing as infrared radiation rather than the microwave radiation we observe today. Telescopes such as Keck, Spitzer, and Hubble have already taken us back to distances of approximately 29 billion light-year, corresponding to times when the universe was only 700 to 800 million years old. At this point, we run into the first edge of the universe, which is the edge of transparency. Before enough stars had formed, the universe was filled with neutral gas and had not yet become fully ionized by the ultraviolet radiation from these stars. As a result, much of the light we observe is obscured by these neutral atoms, and it is only when enough stars have formed that the universe becomes fully reionized. Going further, at a distance of 31 billion light years, corresponding to a time of just 550 million years after the Big Bang, we reach the edge of what we call reionization. Where the majority of the universe is mostly transparent to optical light. Reionization is a gradual process and takes place unevenly, it's like a jagged, porous wall in a lot of ways. Some places see this reionization happen earlier, which is how Hubble spotted its most distant galaxy, which was 407 million years after the Big Bang. But other regions, however, remained partially neutral until nearly a billion years have passed. Going back even further, there are additional edges of interest. 44 billion light years away, the radiation from the Big Bang was so hot that it becomes visible, if a human eye were to exist, it would be able to see that radiation begin to glow red, similar to a red-hot surface. This corresponds to a time just 3 million years after the Big Bang. If we go back to 45.4 billion light years away, we come to a time just 380,000 years after the Big Bang, where it becomes too hot to stably maintain neutral atoms. This is where the leftover glow from the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background, originates from. 46 billion light years away, we come to the earliest stages of all, the ultra-energetic state of the hot Big Bang, where the first atomic nuclei, protons and neutrons, and even the first stable forms of matter were created. At these stages, everything can only be described as cosmic primordial soup, where every particle and antiparticle in existence can be created from pure energy. What lies beyond the frontier of this high-energy soup, however, remains a mystery. We have no direct evidence for what occurred in those earliest stages. The edge of the universe, as it appears to us, is unique to our perspective, we can see back 13.8 billion years in time in all directions, a situation that depends on the space-time location of the observer who's looking at it. The universe has many edges, the edge of transparency, the edge of stars and galaxies, the edge of neutral atoms, and the edge of our cosmic horizon from the Big Bang itself. We can look as far away as our telescopes can take us, but there will always be a fundamental limit. Even if space itself is infinite, the amount of time that's passed since the hot Big Bang is not. No matter how long we wait, there will always be an edge that we'll never be able to see past. 
Some say that beyond the edge, nothing exists. But what exactly do you mean by nothing? I have already made a video on that. You can check it out by clicking the video up on your screen. Thanks for watching and subscribe for more videos.